So if you've been journeying with us, we're coming to the final part of our series called Mind Your Step. And the whole idea behind the series is that being a Christian is not confined to the safe, churchy, Christianized environment, but rather we are called to follow Jesus out there in the real world where there are real problems, real pleasures, real pains, real pressures. And as we walk out our Christian walk, we often find ourselves stubbing our toe and stepping in it with regards to following Jesus. And so this series has been, what are those areas where we need to mind our step that are kind of culturally relevant for us at the moment? And today the metaphor that I want to use is that of, um, it's becoming increasingly part of our South African landscape, the famous pothole. Now, I know when I drive from Brecken Downs to the church, I kind of know where those potholes are, so I know how to avoid them. And that's kind of the point. Some of you know that there are certain streets and certain suburbs maybe where the potholes are more prevalent. And so you're going to be driving carefully. But then there are going to be times like the other day, I was driving in a street that looked pristine. So my mind is not thinking about potholes at all. And inevitably, we hit a brand new pothole. Right, and, and that's got some danger right there. I mean, on one hand, it can just kind of wake you up and get you alert and looking for potholes again. On the other hand, you can burst a tire, you can dent a rim. But sometimes a pothole can be so bad that you're going to hit that pothole, it's going to turn your car out and you can wreck your car. And the reason why this is such an apt metaphor for us today is because as we're walking out our faith, we're going to be hitting these potholes. And some of them are going to do minimal damage. Sometimes a pothole is going to really just maybe move us back two paces. But certain potholes as we live our faith out there can have the power to wreck our faith completely. And so today we're going to be talking about something that is going on that is real and prevalent around us. And that is deconversion. I don't know what sort of social media platforms you're on and what you're exposed to online, but some of you probably know that there have been a number of high profile pastors, authors, worship leaders who are renouncing their faith publicly. And maybe it's not just these famous people out there. Maybe it's people you know, people you grew up with. And as you catch up with them, you find out that they've walked away from the faith. Maybe it's closer to home. Maybe it's a husband or a wife or a child or a parent or a friend. Maybe it's you. Maybe you're sitting here this morning. You're saying, Stephen, I don't know how much faith I have left. And maybe you're on the way out. And this is so real. What makes us so tricky, especially for those of you who are on social media, is that when you hear their testimonies of deconversion, depending on where you're at, it might be heartbreaking, but they can also be so compelling. You know, talking about the big bad church and who wants to be under this big oppressive church environment, right? And they can talk about some of their horror experiences and some of them are real. And, and, and very often what happens is they don't go from being this nice Christian to a cat killing Satanist or an angry atheist is that they continue being wonderful, kind, compassionate people. Some of them may describe the experience as a grieving experience, kind of like a child finding out that Santa doesn't exist anymore. Some people describe it as a freeing experience. I get to live my life my way. I get to carve my way forward. And, and because of the sheer number of these testimonies, and because of how we, we, we hear about these testimonies, they can be so compelling and so they can tap into some of your concerns, some of your pains and can really draw you in to what's going on over there. So how do we do this? How do we navigate this phenomenon well? 
And so if you have your Bibles here, we will have the words on the screen behind me, but turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 10. The Apostle Paul wrote these words, and most scholars agree that these last two chapters of the book of 2 Timothy are probably the last words that he wrote before he died. In other words, he's at the end of his walk of faith. He has poured himself out for the sake of Christ. He is in prison. He has suffered. He has seen incredible churches planted. He has experienced God's grace in a mighty way. He has made it to the end of the road. And now he's speaking to one of his young protégés, young Timothy, who's a pastor at Ephesus. And he too wants Timothy not only to start well, but to end well. And he too wants to put some building blocks in Timothy's faith so that if these building blocks are in place, Timothy will continue to persevere in his faith and in his leadership. And so this passage, we're gonna identify a number of these building blocks that when present, have such power to encourage you and keep you going. But when these very same building blocks turn against us and erode and hurt us, these very same building blocks have the power to erode our faith as well. And so what are these? Well, let's read. I'm gonna read now the first two verses. Paul's writing to Timothy and he says, You, however, know all about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, my faith, patience, love, endurance, persecutions, sufferings, what kinds of things happened to me in Antioch, Iconium and Lystra, the persecutions I endured. And so the first thing that Paul is pointing to is the role of influential people in your life. And man, if you've got a person like Paul in your life and you can look at this guy and see how he's lived out his faith in good times, how he's lived out the reality of his faith in tough times, how he's remained buoyant and faithful and compassionate and loving and courageous and humble in all circumstances. When you can look at someone like that, man, doesn't that encourage your faith? But the same is true when those very same people let us down. People we look up to, spiritually influential people, be they so-called celebrities overseas, or people in our own lives, pastors, teachers, authors, missionaries, parents, life group leaders, peers, people we used to look up to, they drop the ball, they hurt us, they lose the faith, they let us down. That's got such power to deflate our own faith. The second building block is in verse 12. In fact, Here's a verse you don't stick on the back of your car. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ will be persecuted. And so here Paul's talking about the real challenges of faith. I know that in some circles, it's very popular to talk about Christianity as the way to the healthy, wealthy life. I think Jesus was reading a different Bible. I think Paul and the disciples were reading a different Bible. Paul is saying, listen, if those are your expectations, you will be disappointed. And so you and I need to know how to navigate the real challenges of faith. And we need to have our expectations set fairly that we, like Paul, are gonna see great kingdom breakthroughs and we're gonna experience trouble and hardship and even persecution. But if we don't know that, and we're expecting A and we experience B, we might be inclined to give up the faith. Then we get to verse 13 and Paul looks outside the church. He says, while evil men and imposters will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. There's a very real evil out there. All we need to do is look at the news headlines every single day, evil men, evil people, evil experiences, pain and suffering. And this for so many people, just a real experience of saying, listen, God, if you were real and powerful and loving, you would not have let X 
happen. Coronavirus, the war in the Ukraine, me lose my business, lose my wife, lose my husband, lose my child. And so as we engage in this broken world and we come face to face with real pain and evil, that has such power to erode our faith. So we need to know how to navigate that. And we get to verse 14. But as for you, young Timothy, continue in what you have learnt and have become convinced of because you know those from whom you learnt it. Here's Paul is referring to the community of faith that encourages us. In Timothy's case, we learn in 1 Timothy that he got his faith from his gran and his mom. And they grew him up in the faith and gave him the right foundations. And then of course, Timothy being a pastor had people like Paul in his life and had a church community in his life. And once again, there can be something so powerful about a local church. But these very same people have the power to hurt us so deeply. And when this building block crumbles, it can so deeply affect our faith. And then finally, verse 15. And how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. And verse 16 is a very common verse that we refer to that helps us know the role of Scriptures in our life, that the Scriptures can encourage our faith, can make us wise to salvation, can point us towards Jesus, can help us know Jesus, know the heart and the love and the saving power of Jesus, can help us know the will of God, can be living and active in our lives, encouraging us, transforming us by the renewing of our minds. But paradoxically, it is these very same Scriptures that are a problem for so many people. And for a number of different reasons. Sometimes it is because these very same Scriptures are misused, are mistaught, are used as a battering ram, are used legalistically, the letter of the law without the spirits of the law, are used to manipulate, are used for selfish goals and selfish ends. Sometimes it's because, you know, we go to school, we go to varsity and and I hear what I'm being taught in the church environment, I go to varsity and these two don't seem to add up. And so I look at the intersection between Scripture and faith and science or whatever else I'm being taught, philosophy, and I go, no, this isn't adding up anymore. I need to choose one or the other, which by the way, I don't think you have to choose. However, for many people, as these two worlds intersect, they seem to collide. And now which one am I going to go with? That's a real challenge. Sometimes it's because of a real challenging topic that is in Scripture. For example, the violence in the Old Testament. What do we do with that? That goes against everything that I know about God and against about human nature. And as I read these stories, I don't know what to do with that. For some, it's because I I am reading Scripture correctly. There's no misunderstandings. I just don't like what I read. I want to do what I want. I want to drink what I want. I want to eat what I want. I want to sleep with who I want. Scripture doesn't let me do that kind of stuff. So I guess I'm going to go with what I want to do. And we close the Scriptures. And sometimes it's because whether it's something that you've been thinking about, exposed to adversity, YouTube, a friend, a conversation, a book, you get introduced to some supposed contradictions. And you watch this YouTube video and this person makes a compelling case for a so-called error in the Bible. Now you've been taught that the Bible is true and that if there's a single error in the Bible, we need to close it. You start seeing evidence of some so-called alleged contradictions and errors in Scripture. You become convinced of them. And so what do we do? Clearly, this isn't the faith that I thought it was. Now guys, this is very real. If it's not real to you now, it will be. 
We don't have stats like this in South Africa, but in the States, for every convert to Christianity, there are four deconverts. Now, for some of you, you might be saying, Stephen, but I was taught in church that once saved, always saved. I'm not so much, we can have that conversation, but I'm not so much talking about that debate. If your child comes up to you and says, I think that God does not exist anymore, your response isn't, no, but the Bible says once saved, always saved. We're talking about whatever is going on in the background, people's experience of being in the faith experiencing some sort of trauma, some sort of difficult road and choosing to walk away from Christianity. Now here's something that we need to understand it, and we've already seen some of this evidence in these building blocks that Paul is trying to put in place here. But when it comes to someone on the road to deconversion, there are two main kinds of reasons driving that journey. There are cognitive reasons and emotional reasons. Let's talk briefly about the cognitive reasons. These are intellectual reasons, philosophical reasons, Bible fallacies, supposed contradictions. And for those of you who know me, I'm super passionate about this because I fundamentally believe that we do have truth that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, that the Christian worldview is the correct worldview. But I'm not saying that there aren't some difficult conversations to navigate. And so one of the things I decided to do about it, and most of you know this, is write that book, The Reason for Everything. And, and the, the person I was thinking about when I wrote that book is not the philosopher, the theologian, because there's way better books than mine for those people. But for the average person who is going to be confronted with these questions at some point or another, and you need to be equipped, whether it's for your faith's sake or for the faith of your husband or your wife or your children. And so you know how to navigate these intellectual and cognitive challenges to our faith. There are good answers out there. Some of them are in my book. If the ones aren't in there, they're in other great books, other great resources. Now at Riverside, we over the years have spent considerable time speaking about these things. Last year, we did a series called Glad You Asked, where we were able to give not only our Sundays, but some midweek attention. You can go find these on our YouTube channel, Riverside Community SA, where we deal with the kinds of questions that trouble people. So because we've dealt with these kinds of questions extensively, there are some resources available to you. I'm not gonna say much more about the cognitive challenges to our faith. What we so often find is beneath the cognitive challenges and reasons for walking away from faith are emotional reasons. And while when we watch the interviews and they read the testimonies, usually what is presented to you are the cognitive reasons. This biblical fallacy, this philosophical struggle that I've been convinced that the biblical worldview is not true, this biblical contradiction, that is what gets given to you. But I am 100% certain that in most cases. What is driving the cognitive journey is the emotional journey. Now, everyone's journey is different. And for some people, yes, the intellectual issues may be the main thing. But I think in most cases, something goes wrong here and kind of paves the way for the intellectual challenges. So let's talk about the emotional reasons. Some of them Paul has already discussed with, with a young Timothy here. But for many people, what is so difficult to experience in faith is disappointments with God Himself. Just by the way, if that's you, you're not alone. And I don't just mean me or other people in the room, but even our heroes of our faith. David himself wrote the words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Do those words sound familiar? Quoted by Jesus himself on the cross. In the book of Habakkuk, 
Habakkuk's looking around saying, God, all I see is violence. And it seems like you're doing nothing about it. Can you even see what's going on down here, God? Can you do something about it, please? Disappointment with God. This is the person who trusted God for a breakthrough or for the miracle that didn't happen, for the healing that didn't happen, for the business that you trusted God with but failed, for the financial difficulty you went through, for the areas where you risked greatly for God only to feel let down. And here's the thing about these moments in our life is when we experience disappointments with God and we don't know what to do with that, it's not like you're gonna become an atheist overnight, but it's got the power to set in. And over time, your perspective of God is the one who lets me down. And then you hear guys like me and the songs that we sing earlier talking about the goodness of our God and the love and power of your God, of our God. And you're saying, no, that's not Him. Until over time, you believe that. And therefore, over time, you realize if there is a God, it's definitely not that God. Another big factor that has such power to erode our faith is not only disappointment with God, but coming closer to home, disappointment with people. I'm gonna get real with you. And I think it was the Tuesday or the Wednesday during our week of prayer and fasting. I just felt so burdened by the kinds of stuff that I'm speaking about here. Some of the people that I had looked up to that had either greatly uh, fallen from great heights morally or had walked away from the faith. Some of the people that I'd been reading their books and had nurtured faith within me, disappointing me so deeply. I was burdened by people that I knew who had disappointed me. Leaders I had looked up to who had let me down. I was overwhelmed with the fact that so many churches were struggling to keep their doors open after COVID. So many churches were dealing with such toxic environments, toxic leaders, toxic churches. And saying, where Lord is your kingdom? I was taking stock of my own hurts and my own pains. And I was, Lord, If those guys can't make it, what hope do I have? So I know this is real. You know, we talk about churches being such wonderful places of life and community and love and service. And let me tell you, when the church gets this right, there's nothing like the local church. You know, we we talk about the church being the flock, flock of sheep, of course. And so we use these sentimental terms. In our minds, you know, there's these warm, fuzzy, fluffy, huggable Christians. And then we find out that sheep bite. And sheep kick. And some of you have bite marks. And some of you have bruises on your legs. Some of you have wool in your teeth. And bruised toes. You see, the very people who we look to to reflect Christ to me let us down. So what happens is I try another church and then someone there lets me down. That leader doesn't satisfy my expectations. Someone else hurts me. And so then I start to believe there's something wrong with the whole system. And I walk away. Another area that often plays such a huge role in our deconversion is differing values in culture. What this looks like is I read something in Scripture and I look inside of me and I see something different. For example, and and, and this can go two ways. Sometimes it is because of a bad reading of Scripture. Very popular conversation at the moment with the atheists is, look, the Bible endorses slavery. And you look inside of yourself and there's nothing in you that can endorse slavery. So you're saying, well, then I'm with the non-slavery groups, which seem to be the atheists. But that can only come from a poor reading of Scripture. I don't have time to dive into all of these issues 
But when rightly understood, the Scriptures are the foundation upon which all of our conversations around equality and human dignity and anti-slavery are based upon. But we have to be willing to do the work. So sometimes when there's a contradiction between my values and the Scripture's values, it's because I have a faulty reading of Scripture. Polygamy is another one. But then sometimes I am reading the Bible correctly. And as I said earlier, I I wanna eat what I want, drink what I want, sleep with who I want. And the Bible, the church, the pastor, God, seems to be the no fun zone. So let me go with this rather. Let me go with my values. You see, when this is going on, I think we think we're being so objective and rational. We, we, we look at what's going on in Scripture and it just seems to be kind of closed-minded, anti-this, so, so narrow. I look at my own desires, I look at the culture of the world and I'm not being influenced by the culture of the world. It doesn't matter that every sitcom I watch, every series I watch is celebrating pornography and promiscuity. No, I'm not being influenced by that. And then I start to look at the sexual ethics of the Bible versus my own sexual ethics, not realizing how I've been conformed to culture and I make a choice. Now again, this is not everyone's story, but it's, it's so many story, people's story. And once I've got an emotional wound, an emotional basis, then I look for, maybe even unconsciously, the rational basis to reject the faith. Now, for many people, it's not just waking up one day and, okay, I'm walking away from God. One person described it as death of a thousand cuts. Or death by paper cuts. And one day you just wake up and your faith is eroded. It's all gone. Maybe some of you are on cuts 931. And you know you're bleeding and you don't know what to do about it. Now listen, what I've highlighted to you is so important for us to know because whether it's you or someone you know who's walking away from the faith, giving them a a, a little paragraph on WhatsApp, little meme, a little, you know, a little quick little snappy argument, five minute YouTube video isn't going to fix it. What you're talking about are layers of church hurts compounded by disappointments with God, compounded by confusion, compounded by doubt, compounded by sometimes the complexity of engaging with Scripture, compounded by some of the philosophical things I've been exposed to. So we need to know how to journey with people and hear them out and patiently walk with them. But I want to go back to the Timothy text and kind of reframe some of these building blocks that Paul is trying to put in place once again when they're working and where then, when they are in place have such power to encourage my faith and give me perseverance. And when they fall apart, have such power to erode my faith. And so he talks about godly examples of faith in your life, how to navigate the real challenges of faith, how to engage some of the cognitive challenges to our faith, having a life-giving community of faith, and having a solid biblical foundation to our faith. And if these are the areas that have the power to either build or erode our faith, these are the areas that need our attention. And for the one who is losing faith, these are the areas that need redemption. And that's going to take time and some incredible patience and wisdom and some incredible grace. And so maybe as I think about some of these, maybe you're sitting there or or the person that you know is saying, yeah, but but people have let me down, whether it's influential people in my life or or Christian people in my life. I, I want to get real with you. People will let you down. I don't care which church you go to, 
whether in Joburg, South Africa or across the oceans, those leaders, those churches will let you down. I will let you down. The people in this room will let you down. Hopefully not all the time. This is nothing new, by the way. Just read the New Testament. The church has been messed up from day one. It's why we have a New Testament. As Paul brings correction into these early young churches. Stephen, that doesn't sound very encouraging. <laughs> well, luckily our faith is not built on people. You know, the other disciples didn't abandon Jesus because of Judas. They felt betrayed or hurt by Judas. Jesus didn't abandon his mission because he was betrayed by his people. Paul betrayed by his people. Our faith is not in people. And while people can be the most encouraging area in my life of faith, I cannot put my faith in people. And so if that's you, I wanna encourage you to start off by refocusing your faith in the person of Jesus Christ, who He is, what He has done. And even, dare I say, even if every single Christian you know lets you down, Jesus won't. I told you I had that day where I was so burdened by these things. Something I did, and maybe you can do this. Realized there are some great people in my life. There are some people who are walking well and wisely. Yes, I know some people who haven't finished the race well, but there are some people who have finished the race well. And so I choose to recognize the reality of one, but, but be encouraged by the other. And I'm gonna to choose to let them influence me more. But it can't stop there because we've been wounded. So what you need to do, and I say need, capital N, capital E, capital E, capital D, is experience healing and grace and forgiveness in this area. Don't just try harder with the next church. Don't just try harder with the next life group. Don't just try harder not to experience this pain. You need to let the healer in. Let Him forgive you. Let Him release you. Let Him give you grace. Let Him give you healing. And then the next so important step for you, the grace that you have received, you need to now give. Have you been deeply hurt? Yes. But you need to forgive those people, releasing them and releasing yourself. And sometimes, sometimes what you need to do is say, God, where have I been at fault? Show me my heart. Show me where I've gone wrong so that I can receive grace and healing and forgiveness and move on from this. But maybe you feel like faith has let you down. It's not necessarily people. Yes, maybe. But the bigger picture is you feel like God has let you down. Listen, I hate to sound like such a typical pastor now, but this is why theology matters. Unfortunately, the version of Christianity that gets the most YouTube views, that sells the most books, that gets the biggest churches, and I'm not gonna mention name because not every big church falls into this category, but the most prolific version of Christianity globally and in our nation is the version of Christianity that God is there to serve you and make your life awesome and make you healthy and make you wealthy. You know, the only wealthy person there is the guy in the Learjet flying from conference to conference. And so you experience challenges and doubts and some highs and many lows but you've become convinced this isn't what I expected. So not only do you throw out that version of Christianity, you throw the whole thing out. You know, we're very closely related to this idea of deconversion is deconstruction. 
You might have heard that. Now, deconstruction isn't always a bad thing, especially if you've been given a poor version, a non-biblical version of Christianity. You need to deconstruct those. But don't let your deconstruction lead to deconversion. Let your deconstruction lead to reconstruction on the biblical foundation that we have in God's Word. We also, if I feel like God has let me down, we need a framework of faith whereby I can go straight to God with this. I need the language of the Psalms, the language of David, the language of Habakkuk, the language of Jeremiah, the language of Isaiah, the language of Jesus to say, God, I don't know what's going on here. But if in your mind, God is this inaccessible, angry judge, you're not gonna go with Him with your pain and disappointments. So you need a fresh view of who God the Father is so that you can come to Him with those things. We also need a framework of faith that helps me know what God is uniquely doing in me and through me in tough times. That tough times isn't the evidence that God is not at work. It may be the greatest evidence that He is at work. Maybe you're sitting here and those are not your issues. The main issue is a cognitive intellectual issue. You're like saying, Stephen, I don't know what to do with the violence of the Old Testament. I don't know what to do with this contradiction that my friend introduced me to. I don't know what to do with science and faith. I don't know what to do with the fact that that YouTube sounds like he's more on the right page than my pastor. I wanna say to you, this is worth patiently walking through. There are no quick fixes on this one. But I promise you, there are good answers. There are good resources that can help us understand what is in fact true. I've already highlighted some of them to you. But don't be afraid of walking through the valley of the shadow of doubts. Doubt does not mean you're not a Christian. But if you're doubting, I wanna invite you to walk towards God with your doubts. And finally, maybe the Bible itself has been your challenge. And again, maybe it's some bad teaching and some misunderstandings that do need to be dis, uh, um, destructed. But maybe if you're honest, it's the tension between your flesh and the kingdom of God. You want to live life your way. Now, here's the thing. No one's gonna go on YouTube and say, I became an atheist because I wanna sleep with whoever I want. They're gonna give you some intellectual rationale. But maybe the real reason that I left the faith is because I want to sleep with whoever I want. I want to live life my way. I don't like the so-called handcuffs of the Scriptures. And so if you're honest, I want to encourage you to maybe come to a deeper understanding of our faith, a deeper commitment to trust God's ways, God's perspective, God's loving boundaries, God's vision for His kingdom in your life. And one of the many dreams I have for Riverside is that Riverside would be a place where we can walk with people through this stuff. And whether it's someone you know or whether it's you, that there are ways that we can embrace the journey that you're on. And we can continue to encourage you. What you're going through doesn't make you any less. But we do want to see you find God in your pain, in your doubts, and for those roots to go deeper, if you will let Him. And if you'll choose this journey of healing and redemption. 
And so I know we're talking about real stuff here, real pain. So I want to pray for us. Father, the kinds of hurts and pains that I've so quickly gone through, almost doing the real pain of life and injustice can hurt so deeply, can be so painful, not only emotionally, but spiritually, can injure our faith, hamstringing us, eroding our faith. God, I know that none of those experiences mean that you aren't real or true or good or loving or close. But unfortunately, sometimes all of our experiences can make us believe the opposites. And I get it. So Holy Spirit, right now, I ask that if we dare to look up to you, that we see something of your light, something of your hope, something of your grace, something of this invitation back towards you, whether it take seconds or days or weeks or months or years. Father, that because of a return to you, our roots would go deeper. We would experience greater healing, greater forgiveness, greater grace, that we would be matured. That as we go further in life, like your word says, we wouldn't be swayed and thrown back and forth by every wind and wave of teaching. But we'll have a deeper conviction of who you are. And even as we navigate hurts and pains and people and failures of others and our own, that God, we just know that none of that defines us. You alone define us and save us and redeem us. I pray for those of us here who it's not, it's not me. You're not wrestling with your faith, but your heart is breaking for those around you. God, I pray for such wisdom in such difficult, treacherous places where it seems like there's no right thing to say. But God, I pray for grace, your provision, your invitation, hope for healing. But for those who are here and they're on cut 961, I pray that your Holy Spirit has given a new sense of life to them this morning. And if that is you, I, I just, in the quietness of your own heart, just to decide, are you going to be a product of your pains and your doubts? Or maybe you can choose to walk towards grace. Jesus Himself, healing, recovery, redemption. Father, as we end the service together, I pray that your real work would begin. I can't save anyone. No one here in this room can save anyone. You alone can save. And your spirit is the one that convicts and invites. So God, would you do a great work? A great work. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.